to game one and see if Cramorant can flip enough heads or the Eternus <laughs> deck can slow him down enough. Yeah, although Cramorant is flipping coins, which a lot of players will try and work against a lot of the time, they want to have guaranteed uh, damage in play. There's just so many coins that you get to flip with this deck <laughs> when you eventually factor in all of the powerful colorless energies and you have the triple acceleration energies. You can deal a massive heap of damage as it looks like we're kicking off from Robin's side. He has the quick ball that can go ahead and establish himself, uh, most likely a Porygon here. Yeah, you need to get that Porygon Z. Of course, Porygon Z lets you attach as much special energy during your turn as you like. You're usually limited to one energy attachment during your turn, but Porygon Z says, nope, not listening to that. I will attach as much as I like. You've then got Cramorant, where you flip one coin for each energy attached to it, and you deal 80 damage for each heads. So you've got some natural synergy there. You use Porygon Z to pile energy on, and then you hope you flip enough heads with Cramorant VMAX to deal enough damage. And, and something like a turn right you're talking 340 hp the highest hp we've seen in the game and actually that is well within range of a crammer and v max yeah that's what sets this archetype aside from basically every other deck crammer and v max can knock out opposing v maxes and without weakness no other v max can boast that so that's really the the win condition of this Cramorant V Max archetype. And let's not forget that the Cramorant V can also put in a lot of work here. It looks like Robin actually did prize a couple of his regular Cramorant Vs. So he's gonna have to hope that the two that he has uh, access to is gonna do a lot of work here. A pretty awkward start. He had to get rid of one of his two Glimwood Tangles and Frederico is actually playing Chaotic Swell. So Robin's hand isn't looking ideal for next turn. Frederico does already have that energy drop and he can also Crobat for one additional card here. Absolutely, he can. It's, it's it's a bit of a slow start. I mean, you don't really... Oh, he's going to drop the Marnie. There we go. So you don't usually want to Crobat for one card. Of course, Crobat is limited to once during your turn. But you need to get your Pokemon established. Eternatus does more damage for each of your Darkness Pokemon in wow. play. That's a nice <laughs> hand that Robin Finn marnie into, mind you. That's incredible. It looks like Frederico really with the Marnie here. He's hoping to find some of these crushing hammers that he plays, does fire one off here. Unfortunately gets tails, but Power Accelerator is a big deal. He wasn't able to establish any more energies into play, which he certainly would have liked. But look at this, Robin's got himself naturally into rare candy Porygon Z from a Marnie, no less. And, and triple acceleration energy. Here. Yeah, so he can he can Skylar most likely just for a Dedene or a Crobat of his own. He can probably has to throw away the triple acceleration energy, but gives him a lot of push potential here. He's already got the telescopic sight as well, so he could be looking to take an easy two prize knockout with spit shot this turn, just onto that benched crowbat. So doesn't even need the VMAX uh, out the gate this turn, really. No, that is lovely. Of course, Cramorant can do 160 damage to the bench. Telescopic Sight means it's an extra 30. As long as you're attacking a Pokemon GX or V, it means instead of just going after Dedene, you can go after Crobat as well. So you're right, he does have to discard the Triple Acceleration Energy, but you need your Porygon Z and your Rare Candy, and that Telescopic Sight is what's going to get you the KO. So as long as Robin can draw a couple of energy off this Crobat, we are going to see an early two-prize advantage for Robin. This is incredible pressure as well. Look at this, he's got himself enough energies. He also has more potential push with Dedene GX if he wishes also. This is looking excellent for Robin. Yeah, this is a very nice start. He's got the Recycle Energy, of course. One of the things about Spit Shot is that you have to discard the energy when you use it. So the Recycle Energy bouncing back to your hand is an absolutely great advantage there. And it's now up to Robin, like, how many of these energy does he actually want to attach? Of course, if he does use Spit Shot, he is discarding them all. Does he want to lose three of his, you know, that many energy so quickly? But then again, it's Capture Energy, so I think he's probably going to be all right. Yeah, I think you just pile everything into the active and hope to dead a change into that VMAX. I mean, if you take the knockout this turn, you wipe all energy off the board. This could just get incredible here. He's got a couple capture energies, so he can fill his board quite happily. He can also um, quick ball just to thin his deck as well if he wants to, because he's already holding on to a Dedene GX. You're going to see that backup Cramorant coming in from the capture energy. It is a hand attachment from the crazy code, so you do get the activation, which is a nice little thing to bear in mind as the games go forward. But so far, four energies onto that Cramorant V. He's just going to go ahead, take another Porygon out for the backup. He can then quick ball away uh, the Porygon that's in his hand and probably thin yet another card from his deck, probably just the other Porygon at that point. And then he's just looking for that VMAX, really. 
Yeah, I mean, this is looking brilliant. You've got the backup plan. If you whiff the VMAX, then you can still get the two prize KO on that Crobat anyway. But obviously what you want to do... Oh, oh and there is the oh, VMAX. Boy. <laughs> a couple more energies as well. This is incredible. This is going to be a We're gonna have KO if we get the head splits. We are. And of course, Robin did have the Glimwood Tangle in hand, but it did go away with the Marnie. But... I think that is about the only thing that's happened that isn't ideal for Robin so far. This has been just a phenomenal first couple of turns. What do we see with Max Jet? Oh, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh what a mess. He needed the three heads and was only able to achieve two. So that's a bit of a downer for Robin, but the positioning is still insane. He's got the ideal turn two board state, essentially, with a giant Cramorant, and wow, Frederico has... Nothing in response. He's just able to hit for 30 as Robin's just going to carry on flipping coins at this stage. I mean, what an incredible board state he has comparatively. He's even managed to get himself a backup Porygon Z just in case one goes down. So this is just... I mean, at this stage, if you're Frederico, what do you do? You, you kind of have to try and KO the Cramorant. Now, the good news is that Cramorant is, I believe, now in range of Eternatus' attack if he gets a VMAX and an Energy and four more bench Pokemon. But even now, that is asking an awful lot straight off the bat. And Robin is almost certainly going to be up two prizes unless things go very, <laughs> very wrong. Yeah, Federico can see it. He knows that he's really not holding on to much. Going down a couple prizes really early on in that game with no energy remaining in the field means that that Cramorant is just going to continue to flip those coins and continue to munch through the board and get an even greater advantage. What an incredible Marnie that was. I mean, Robin's <laughs> hand was looking very poor, to be honest. He was really in top deck mode of his own, but it's pretty rare that someone's holding on to a two rare candy hand and then you get marnied into another rare candy plus the stage two that you actually need what a what an incredible money that was yeah i mean it was such a good money he actually had to discard the triple acceleration energy which of course gives you free coin flips on a grammar and v max it's a phenomenal card and robin was like you know what i've drawn so well I'll, I'll just discard that and carry on with my turn and i mean federico's hand must have been terrible because you know robin was going up two prizes there was a chance of a return ko if Frederico had a really good turn, but unfortunately that was just absolutely not going to happen, apparently. Frederico scoops them. We're going to head on into game two where, I mean, certainly Frederico is hoping things are going to go quite a bit better. Yeah, absolutely. It can't get much worse than that. He got a power <laughs> accelerator for no backup energy attachments. He wasn't able to money himself into any additional draw, no Crobats, no ball search whatsoever. One of the best things about Eternatus VMAX is that you have so much ball search, you get to play that higher Marnie count and know that on the other side of that hand, you're more than likely going to get out of it. But in this case, not so. Frederico, he's going to start off this second game. He gets his early game attachment down and passes it straight over to Robin. No, I mean, that's not, that's not a terrible start, to be fair. You want the energy on so you can get the turn to attack. And that's what Frederico's rolling for here, right? He really wants to try and make sure he gets a big attack with Eternatus on turn two before Robin's got a chance to evolve up and really get going. And Robin is playing a setup deck. He needs his stage two. He needs his evolved VMAX. There is a chance that Robin does have a slower start and Frederico can take advantage. Of course, Crammer and V having beat catch is... Um, quite a huge advantage when you're talking about that. Yeah, and I think Robin's hand is already pretty good. He's got this incense that he's probably just going to put back into the deck with a communication. It means he can go ahead and grab that first Cramorant. Then he can also catch energy out a second Cramorant. He's already got two Porygons, so he can do both those things. He's losing a powerful colorless energy, which is a little bit awkward. But outside of that, I mean, he can just go ahead and play Professor's Research and get a fresh seven. So not bad overall. He could also value the powerful colorless more uh, because it does mean that you need one less heads flip he actually does go for the powerful colorless i don't mind this at all because like we said one less flip that you require is actually really important especially when you know that frederico may be denying your glimwood tangle with chaotic swell yeah absolutely it means you need to flip four heads rather than five that's like you say it's a very big deal we do and from robin's point of view here i mean the good news is he's got a bunch of energy but he doesn't have a way to get that Cramorant in the active. Beat catch there for a rare candy Porygon Z would have been absolutely perfect, but there's no way to get the Porygon out of the active, so he, he changes it over to Frederico, and let's see if Frederico's got a better hand than last time. Looks like he's already powered up that Eternatus V as long as he's able to find a VMAX, which he now does. 
fires off a crushing hammer, doesn't get heads, unfortunately. And again, it's down to that Marnie. Once again, most likely helping Robin out, realistically, because like we said, he didn't have any way to get the Porygon Z into play. And now, yeah, a pretty reasonable hand. He can try and do some Crobat digs before going for Dedenne GX. So again, the Marnie actually bailing Robin a little bit here. Frederico does find himself a backup Eternatus, also Great Balls into a Spiritomb. He's got enough damage now for a KO. He can also build Spite, uh, which is just something to have in the back to try and skew that prize trade if ever you're able. Crow batting up as well, so a much better start than before. Yeah, I mean, the turn two VMAX with a two energy on is what you're looking for in an Eternatus deck. You just want to make sure you've got that Eternatus ready to go turn two. Because like we saw in, in game one, although Robin can do huge damage, there's always a chance you just flip too many tails and then that Eternatus gets to survive for a few hits and really start going through Robin's board. It is a possibility, and I think when you're Frederico, until you can get those Spiritomb hitting really good damage, that's essentially what you're going for here. You need to get your early Eternatus, try and get some KOs, and just kind of hope that Cramer at VMAX doesn't go off. We do see Frederico valuing that uh, new Galarian coughing, or the, the regular coughing, it's just the Galarian wheezing, right? Uh, right. But it has that new Ascension attack that can allow you to get into a wheezing later. Looks like Robin here, he's got himself a capture energy which he can turn attach. He probably quick balls away quick ball here, looking for Crobat. If he's able to Crobat into a rare candy, he could then pop off massively by looking for a VMAX and looking for other things here. Let's see what he takes. Yeah, he's exactly going to go for this quick ball play. I feel like Crobat makes a lot of sense. You have yeah. a huge high roll potential again, where you flip four heads and you just knock out the Eternatus and all energy in play. So... It's a really big push that he can try and make here with Crobat plus the Dene, and then hopefully a draw supporter in between as well. Yeah, I mean, if Robin get a KO here, that would all but end the game. That would put him in just a ridiculously good position. And you're right, playing the Crobat here, it means you get to draw four cards. Porygon Z is already in hand. You just need that rare candy. He is going to hit double rare candy as it happens. <laughs> This is really nice. He can Dede change now, and then he still has a supporter after this Dede change, potentially. So a ton of push. Still does need that VMAX and a ton of energies. The Skylar could help out as well. So he has found Glimwood Tangle. He has found that VMAX. He's actually a little bit short on energies here, surprisingly. Uh, not very often you can say that, but he does have four here. He would need to get all heads if he was to take a knockout. He does have the potential to take a spit shot two prize KO as well. That might be what his debate is here whether or not to flip some coins or just take the damage as it lies. He does already have the telescopic sight attack, so... Oh, the debate is real here. We don't usually see players thinking this much, but he is going up into the VMAX. Usually the VMAX is an absolute given. Crammer and V just happens to have a really good attack. I mean, Crammer and V has been played since Sword and Shield came out. It has been a staple deck in, a staple card, sorry, in Welder decks and a whole bunch of others. We've seen it in Frostmoth decks. We've seen it all over. It just so happens it now has a really good VMAX to go along with it. So it looks like Robin's got the Glimwood Tangles, got the four energy. I mean, what do you Skylar for here? Because you can't Skylar four energy, unfortunately. Yeah, I think you just grab research for next turn so you yeah. can have that reload. Uh, your Cramorant isn't isn't going to get knocked out. So you can flip these coins. If you hit all four heads, oh. it's insane. <laughs> he probably takes these reflips here. Um, but uh, doing equally as poorly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly <laughs> the same. The flips. Um, but he's hoping that next turn the Cramorant takes a big hit. You can profess his research, then try and find some triple accelerations and finish off this Eternatus. We must stress that there's only two Glimwood Tangle in the deck. Robin has established one early, and uh, if Frederico can find um, that Chaotic Swell, he can completely deny those reflip turns. So that's important to note here. It would essentially counter both the stadiums in one, which would be huge. And I believe this is open deck list. I believe you can see your opponent's deck list in Players Cup 3. And he definitely could in Players' Cup too. And that means that the players are aware of this. That's why we don't see Robin playing Glimwood Tangle early. Because, you know, that Chaotic Swell, it, it's too good of a counter, quite frankly. So you play it when you need it. And I want to point out, of the three times that Robin has flipped, he's gone under 50% all three <laughs> times. Yeah, you never want to have that low side of variance. I mean, you could argue that he's had the good side of variance just from, you know, Marnie's <laughs> helping him out quite a lot. But there's yeah. even more variance to be had exactly with this deck because of these coin flips. 
It's what puts a lot of players off. It, Kramer and VMAX was originally seen as a little bit of a joke deck. When we saw the card, people went, oh, it's, it's like that old Blissey that nobody really played, and... It's kind of like that Maractus that nobody plays. We've seen attacks like this in the past, but the thing about Cramorant is, because it's colourless and it can take such good advantage of those cards like Powerful Colourless Energy, Capture Energy, Recycle Energy that are colourless, it just, with Porygon Z, is such a great option. And this did get third place at a 2,000-person tournament in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. So this isn't just Robin, this is... Cramer and VMAX is a legitimate top tier archetype now. Yeah, a couple of big differences. Like you said, the recycle energy obviously being a huge one, and just that Cramerant sticks in play. So you can take turns off where you don't really do much, and you're still just there flipping, you know, sometimes five, six, seven, eight coins. And you just, you know, even if you are flipping the coins, you just have such a good multiplier that you still get there a lot of the time. Now we Actually, do see. coming in now, yeah. Yeah, Crushing Hammer's come down. Frederica's actually, he's established his board quite well. But Eterna just doesn't do enough damage. And there's no backup attacker, really. Frederico doesn't have an energy on his bench to Eternatus. And if Robin takes a big KO here, that could be huge. Uh, we do find a couple energies here. No guarantees, but at least the Glimwood Tangle has stayed in play. Federico really was probably digging hard for that one counter stadium or dangerous drill even as an option that he does play in his deck. So there's no... Surefire way of taking a KO for Robin here. Only five coin flips in air quotes to try and reach that <laughs> knockout. And I'm looking at Frederico's board. That Spirit Tomb could actually be potentially getting a return KO next turn. So Frederico might not need a backup Eternatus here. That Spirit Tomb could both take a KO and give him a turn to attach to Eternatus. So I'm watching that Spirit Tomb right now because if Robin gets a KO here and it's kind of looking like that's quite likely... I think Spirit Tomb, maybe with a Galarian Zigzagoon, could save the day. Now we see the heads coming out. <laughs> it's over 50%. That's enough. 50%. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> and like you say, it's actually a really big deal because Robin only plays one copy of Telescopic Sight. So if this Spirit Tomb does take that KO, it's actually really going to be effective at skewing that prize race. Otherwise, you could just, you know, find that Telescopic Sight and spit shot a Crobat after you deal with that Spirit Tomb. Uh, but now it's actually going to force Robin to find um, Gust instead. And he actually doesn't play any Gust in his deck, so, yeah, he, he has to go through whatever Federico puts up, essentially. And that, well, I mean, it basically turns Spirit Tomb into a, into a free turn for Federico. You've got a KO2 Eternatus V Max. If you KO a Spirit Tomb, wow. you've still got a KO2 Eternatus V Max. Wow, look at this. So many energies that Robin has gone into. <laughs> uh, after the Spirit Tomb most likely comes in and takes the KO here, he will be getting two Recycle Energies back into his hand. So potentially what he could try and go for is maybe Cramorant coming in and just spit-shotting the VMAX, hoping that Spiritomb just is out of range on too many Pokemon. That could be his line. We'll see what Federico has up his sleeve from here after that Marnie. Absolutely. It's, um... I mean, it's, it's given Robin a lot of energy and not much else, but then he doesn't... Well, they suppose he's going to need to be Max next turn, though, potentially, so things could get awkward. If Frederico is able to chain a couple of KOs together, this could be... Oh, we do see nice. the Dangerous Drill. You called it, Joe. Yeah, it's a really oh, big like... deal here. You need to get rid of this Glimwood Tangle. It's too scary to... Especially when you're giving your opponent back two energies straight away through these recycles. As soon as Robin's deck is sort of... Mid to that sort of mid to late game point where you just get that guaranteed damage back, you really need to get rid of those Glimwood Tangles. Yeah, it's it's absolutely big. And now, you know, Robin, it, it's so hard when you're only playing two of them. It's not it's not gonna stay in play that much. Now here does come the Spirit Tomb. It's hitting for 70 damage as it stands at the moment. I mean, it's one of the best single prize attackers that we've got around. It's just, it pops up in so many different decks. It's, it's really efficient. Yeah, and it's doing exact math, right? Or do we... Uh, the Kramer actually has 330 hits. I think points. it's 330, so... So the build oh. finally gets him there. There we go. So now he is dealing enough with the Anguish Cry to take a three-prize response KO. He's essentially setting himself up for boss's orders with the Eternatus VMAX to close the game here. So he's in a pretty decent spot, and Robin can't do much to deny this. He plays one copy of Reset Stamp, and his hand is entirely energy right now, so he's in need of a top deck. <laughs> 
He really is in need of a top deck, because if that Cramorant goes down, there really isn't very well. I mean, I suppose, sorry, Frederick has only got two prizes remaining. That would definitely end the game. Yeah. So, I mean, we need a big KO here. And as it stands, like you say, there's no V Max, there's no gusting, there's no draw, there's there's really not very much of anything on Robin's side, and he draws another energy. So it looks like what Robin's gonna have to do is he's gonna have to take the KO with Porygon Z this turn with a triple acceleration and then just pile five energies onto the Cramoran V. I think that's what we'll be seeing this turn. <laughs> so that he can tantrum take the one prize, force Federico <laughs> to have Gust. And uh, yeah, really, <laughs> that's all he can do at this stage. He might want to hold one energy just for retreat outs, but he loses to Gust regardless. So he has to pile five energies onto this Cramoran, I think. Uh, you can't really thin the deck of any Pokemon because you want that board space to be open if he does draw any ball search cards, anything like that. So you probably just swing the capture on and leave the triple acceleration in your hand. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is exactly what you have to do here. You can't use any of these cards because you're hurting your outs um, for other Dedenne and Crobat, I think, if there are any remaining... Oh, no, there aren't any Cro yeah. uh, in his prize cards, right? So he's hoping to take one off of these prizes. So that's essentially it. Take the KO, hope to find one of those helpful V or GX Pokemon from the prizes here. Does and pick he up does. the Dene. So it is, the ball is in Federico's court to have a Gust card here. Not much, his hand size is giant. We do see a Dark <laughs> Energy, and inevitably, the Boss is, is there. Yeah. Yeah, so Federico does get the KO on the Dene. We'll even it up at one game apiece. And. Well, I, I think we've just seen the upside and the downside of Crammer and VMAX. If you don't take those big KOs early and your opponent gets a bit of a ball stake going and you can't return the KO, that that game looked a lot more like everyone expected Crammer and <laughs> VMAX to look. Yeah, Crammer looks a lot less impressive when you're two-shotting other VMAXs like any other one would in the format, right? You're yeah. hoping to gain advantages with big blowout one-hit KOs or that spit shot taking knockouts, especially on Crobats. So. Uh, Robin having to establish the telescopic sight early as well hurt him a little bit, so he couldn't have those options available to him. But yeah, essentially Eternatus just was a good pace setter, got that early prize on the Porygon, which really helped him out later down the line for his prize race. It really did. It worked out perfectly in terms of getting to six prizes, and that's what Eternatus does. It's two energy, it's a single evolution into a VMAX, and you just do a huge amount of damage and run through. Eternatus has been doing this since it released, and honestly, it's one of the very best decks in the format for a reason. The good news is we are in a best of three, though, so let's head on over to game three and see which of these players is going to be able to advance through the winner's bracket. Like we said earlier, we're in round six here. They are two wins away, if they stay in the winner's bracket, from making the global finals. If you drop to the loser's bracket, that is going to add some more victories needed needed to get through, that is not where either of these players wants to be. And Robin gets the advantage of going first here. He has early game ball search, which is great. He even has picked up the Porygon Z now, so he could simply quick ball away potentially the reset stamp if he just wants to have a backup Pokemon here. Or he could hold his entire hand, knowing that he can Skylar for the rare candy next turn, and then evolve into that VMAX and hope to um just quick ball into dead change that sort of thing and really push on from there um so yeah not a bad start some of the huge advantages of this deck as you've already mentioned ross capture energy just gives you so many good outs to get your early game basics into play it's such a good card and it's one of the things i love about crammer and you get all of these colorless energies that are really good but the downside is they only provide colorless energy and then you get a colorless deck like this that can attach as many of them during turn as you like you know we're not seeing draw energy from robin that draws you a card when you attach it's a great card but it doesn't make the cut because we've got powerful colorless energy, recycle, capture, triple acceleration. There are quite literally too many good colorless special <laughs> energy that, you know, something like draw energy would be great in this deck. And I've seen Liss playing it, but it's just not good enough. And you're right, Robin has set himself up beautifully for turn two. What an insane hand he's sat on. He's got that <laughs> Skylar rare candy and he can go quick ball Crobat for five and Dedenne for an additional six. He's He's got everything he wants. This is the first hand that he's holding on to that Federico should not be Marnie. <laughs> uh, well, he should be Marnie, right? Uh, because the hand is so strong. Whereas previously, he's Marnie to help out Robin. This time, he's actually holding on to a gas hand. And we actually see the Professor's research here, throwing away a couple of darkness energies, a couple of switches, 
as Federico is missing his Eternatus V right now. And we saw a Crobat for zero cards, which, you know, crushing hammer heads is nice, but the thing about Crobat for zero cards is that generally speaking, you play your supporter, you play a couple cards, then Crobat gives you an extra advantage. Playing Crobat here, because, I mean, if nothing else, that Evil Tal war would have been the lone basic, and it... I'm not seeing much going on on Frederico's board. He does have the quick pull, though. Let's hope he's got an energy. Oh, had to get rid of VMAX to play it. It's always really sad when you don't attach an energy and then you play a supporter and then you don't draw an energy. Mm -hmm. And Eternatus, you know, there's no other way that you can manipulate energy cards. It's simply one attachment per turn is all you're getting. So you need to make the most out of them and missing a turn of attachment is always very, very detrimental. He's going to pick up a Crobat here. So he didn't use Dark Asset on the first Crobat. He just benched it raw. So he could still be digging here with his second Crobat. I believe he didn't draw off the first one. He does No, he didn't draw any cards. Which is nice. Yeah, so the Crobat is optional. So this time he is able to choose to Dark Asset, which is really important. He does get that energy. He ha finds himself an early game Spiritomb to begin building that spite. We saw how important it was in that second game. And it doesn't look like he's going to be going for Power Accelerator here. We don't see any other backup Eternatus. That would be the telltale sign that you'd go for. Um, he may want some chip damage in, though. It's a difficult one because you know that there's the burst potential that Robin has. So I like leaving the Evil Tile in the active here. Yeah, no, I like it a lot as well. I mean, that Spirit Tomb was actually really, really important with the lack of gusting in Robin's deck and the fact that Eternatus is going to be about 60 damage away from getting a KO. It, assuming a full bench, that is that that spirit tomb being able to take a KO while only giving up one prize is absolutely huge. Now I'm fairly sure we are going to see the Skylar for a rare candy here, and then it really is just down to how many cards can Robin draw, potentially using a Dedene and a Crowback, getting the energy, but. We're worried a little bit here, of course, because you don't really want to KO that evil towel. Your route to victory, you want it to be KO2 Eternatus V Max. So now that we've seen the evolution, it does look like it is going to be just a KO on the evil towel. Hopefully, we will see a spit shot into a Crobat V later on to essentially offset the KO on the evil towel. Yeah, that's the only way he can make that map work out for him. He does get rid of the uh, reset stamp for this quick ball here. Obviously, he doesn't want to give Federico an additional card. He may also choose to play the Evolution Incense just to remove it uh, so he can draw an additional card with his own Crobat here. So just like last time, on these push turns, you play your Skylar, you then play your Incense for no effect, you candy into your Porygon Z, and then you're hoping that the 11 cards that you're drawing this turn is going to be enough to find your energy cards. You would certainly hope so. <laughs> Especially, the Yveltal is small, so you only need a few heads on your side. He needs three requisite energies to attack. That's what he's got already. He can now um, communication back in the second backup to Dene for him as well. He can go ahead and establish a second Cramorant. He finds some powerful colorless energies. He finds one Recycle so far. All good news for him. Pretty much the ideal cards he could have received from that Crobat. Nothing wasted at all. And he's still going to get an additional six here, which is excellent. Yeah, this is wonderful. Using that communication to grab yourself another basic and then playing the Dene without discarding anything from your hand. That is, that is absolutely beautiful. I mean, Robin's deck, we've seen over the three games, it's, it's running quite well. We're, it's setting up. I mean, in all three games, we've seen a setup. In game two, it really was flipping tails and not being able to keep up that speed in the mid game. And that turn where he ended up with seven energies in hand and nothing else. That's what's hurt Robin here. In terms of the early game getting rolling, this Cramorant deck seems to be performing admirably. Here is the additional six. He does find a couple more energy cards with two powerful colorless already attached. He only needs one heads flip here. It always feels good to attach more recycle energies, though, because then even if you are hand disrupted, you can uh, still get out of that. He could just throw everything into the active, knowing that his Cramorant cannot be one hit KO'd. He could also choose to hold it. I think that's also not a bad decision. He can use it potentially for retreat outs if uh, Federico is trying to go for stalling plays or anything like that. Um, and he already thinks that he has pretty much variants on his side to take this one prize. Yeah, flipping zero heads here would be very upsetting. You've, you've got to think, right? There's what? I think a, a 15 and 16 chance of hitting at least one heads here. Oh, oh no! 
<laughs> you had to say the odds, Ross. You had to <laughs> say Why it. did I say the odds? <laughs> Curse of the commentator for Robin as Federico <laughs> gets a free turn here. Incredible so to sorry, see. Robin. <laughs> as, uh, yeah, Federico, just a free turn that he seriously was not expecting. And uh, he's able to develop his board a little bit here. VMAX into play. Zigzagoon starts coming down. These... Uh, headbutt tantrums aren't integral for the uh, math fixing, so he's just going to swing one onto a Porygon Z by the looks of things. Let's see if he has uh, any way that he can launch his own attack here. If he has supporters, energy cards, that's what he's looking for. We haven't seen any draw from him just yet. No, well, one thing Federico doesn't play in his deck is Scoop Up Net. And some Eternatus builds do play Scoop Up Net. Mine certainly does. And there was always, if you were, that there's this weird potential of maybe I can get six Galarian Zigzagoon in one turn and then get a one-hit KO. It's unlikely, but the possibility is there. Without Scoop Up Net in the deck, Federico, like you said, cannot get a one-hit KO on a Cramorum. So now, what do we do here? Do we maybe poke a little bit with Spiritomb? and then try and finish with Eternatus and say, look, I've got a giant Eternatus. You have got to care it right now. Bearing in mind, I've just taken most of your energy off the board. Or do you go into the Eternatus now and use Spiritomb potentially as a backup? We did see an energy being taken away with that dangerous drill. Yeah, that's not a bad play. He wants to limit the uh, VMAX as much as possible, give Robin the least amount of coin flips. As you see, sometimes they can just go wrong for him. Federico, he hasn't slammed down any energy card just yet. As you say, there's a small debate here whether he wants to get the early chip damage in with his Spiritomb, if possible, or if he thinks that Robin's hand is limited enough that he could risk using Eternatus aggressively to get the damage just straight onto the board. So it could be a debate here. It is going to go into that Spiritomb. It's the play that we saw last game pretty effectively for him last time. And it looks like at the moment we're just going to see 70 with the Anguish Cry. I, I do, I like this play. The idea is you bring in the Eternatus to take the KO, and then you've got the undamaged Eternatus, and potentially all the energy has gone off the field, just making Robin's job of getting the KO that much more difficult. Good news for Robin, he's got plenty of energy in hand, he's got a decent board set up. Bad news, as we've mentioned a couple times, and it really does bear repeating, there's no gusting in Robin's deck. Right now, using a boss's orders to try and grab an Eternatus and flipping some coins, that would be a really good way to go about doing it. If all he's doing is just getting a KO on the Spiritomb here, is that really enough board pressure at this stage of the game? And his hand is looking really weak after this play as well, especially if Federico can respond with a KO. Robin's really going to need the help of this prize card here to see if it can get him out of the rut that he's in. He doesn't really want to commit another board space to um, any of those small helpful Pokemon, so finding that research is a really nice prize for him, keeping him in the game, I'd say. It is, and if I'm Robin, I'm upset right now because he finally flips three out of four heads, <laughs> and it's when you're attacking a Spiritomb. Yeah, a bit of over, over KO there, doing <laughs> easily enough damage to deal with a little Spiritomb with only 40 hit points remaining. Federico is now finally going to commit energy to his Eternatus VMAX. It also fires off a Crushing Hammer, and he's playing the Marnie here. He still needs a few Pokemon, I believe, to reach with his Dread End here. Um, so he's going to look to find some more Pokemon to put into play. Another Returnatus is a good start for him. I believe he needs a full bench. Full bench would be 270, plus a 70 on his 340. That would be the KO. So I think as it stands at the moment, Federico's actually two Pokemon shy... And there is the Crobat drawing another four cards. Can one of them be a Pokemon? Desperately needs one here. He has a few coughings still waiting around. He's got more Eternatus Vs he could play. In the worst case, he could put down a Crobat V as well, just for no effect, just for damage. Does he get there? Let's have a look. He plays two Galarian Zigzagoon as well. He may just be sure. I, I imagine you'd slam it down straight away if you had it. I would it. think so. <laughs> <laughs> also got himself the Celtic Swell, which is also a huge deal, making his Eternatus even more uh, tanky, hopefully. He does have that Quick Ball, so he will be establishing that final Pokemon that he needs to take the knockout here. Over a couple of turns, it's going to be an Eternatus V as his selection, and he's going to go ahead in this prize race now. 
He is, and let's not forget, he did hit a heads on crushing hammer onto that bench crammer. And so not only do we see the KO, but actually knocks a bunch of energy off. Of course, the fact that two of them were recycle energy obviously helps hugely here. And honestly, like, as far as I'm concerned, this is the turn for Robin. Robin needs a huge KO here. Because, frankly, th there's no energy on a bench to turn at us. So if Robin can get a KO here, then Frederico is going to really struggle to two-hit KO it because you need two energy on the Eternatus, but then if you attach to Spirit Tomb, you can also attach to Eternatus. A big KO here is going to put Frederico in a super awkward position energy-wise, so I think at this stage, Robin just really needs to try and, well, just get the energy on and go a little bit nuts. Yeah, interesting. He, he chose not to take the capture energy proc here. I thought he may have potentially gone for Skylar for Telescopic Sight, take the two prize KO that's on the board and just capture another Cramorant to the bench and then just try and take stuff off the prizes that help you out a little bit. This time he has to Skylar to try and find a Dedene most likely and just dig through his deck. And it means that he really needs to find a lot from the from this draw here. I feel like the capture energy for the backup Cramorant was probably the strongest move he could have gone for. He's eyeing things up now. He has one Cramorant VMAX in the deck. He is eyeing up what else he can do. He can play the uh, telescopic... Oh, sorry, he can play the Glimwood Tangle just to bounce. But still looking a little bit awkward for him here. So he's just going to go for the communication, grab the VMAX immediately, and just take the take the flips, really, I think, here. He's hoping that the six coin flips is going to be enough. He needs five of the six, I believe, because he doesn't have any powerful colors established. So really low odds. It's a lot to ask for. I mean, this this was what I was essentially looking at. It's You're right. It, it's not an amazing play because you need to flip all the heads, but this would basically end the game. A KO here would put Frederico in an absolutely terrible position. So you're right. There definitely were other ways to go, trying to take a bench KO and then work on getting more prizes later. But, I mean, Robin, it's got zero cards in hand. I mean, this is... This is be so huge. Oh, no. <laughs> no! <laughs> I mean, he needed he needed five of the six. So it was a big dreamer play. You have to respect it. He also knows the prizes better than we do as well. So he may have thought that taking that tempo two prize KO and setting up a backup grammar wasn't enough to push towards game. It gave him additional top deck as well. Uh, we also see a crushing hammer getting heads again really limiting the coin flips that robin has available to him it is going to be the dread end into the active um there was you know there's just a better board position for federico here and oh. wow just the glimwood tangle not doing it for him robin is just forced to concede here and he's thinking about it yeah <laughs> he does he does concede in the end so yeah, just some awkward hands there, you know, didn't have the flips on his side. You know, when you're in that Hail Mary situation trying to get five out of six, you have to say that it wasn't just bad luck. You were really trying to make a big push there to steal a game, and he wasn't able to in that case. No, unfortunately not. And the worst bit is he did flip five <laughs> tails. <laughs> So what Not he flipped enough. was just, well, it was just as likely as what he wanted, but just the other way round. And that essentially is a downside of Cramorant. We we just watched a free game series, right? Cramorant won one of those free games and, and unfortunately dropped Robin down to the loser's bracket. But if those flips had gone differently, Robin could have won all three of those games. And that, that's one of the things I love about Cramorant. No game, as long as you get set up, and we saw how well the deck set up. When the deck sets up, you're in every game. It's just the number of heads you need to flip that really changes. And with Eternatus' giant HP and Spiritu really putting in the work with some Crushing Hammer heads, it was just all a little bit too much. And we saw how it could have gone the other way, but in the end, Eternatus is one of the best decks for a reason. And congratulations to Frederico. Really recovered beautifully after what was a, a pretty terrible game one. <laughs> yeah, he uh, certainly got over that early game sort of lack of draw and just having nothing going for him. He had some great tech cards. He had Crushing Hammers. He had that Dangerous Drill as well as Celtic Swell actually being a huge card. Didn't allow Robin to establish that Glimwood Tangle on that final Hail Mary moment. So yeah, his tech cards really coming in clutch here to see him through uh, what is, you know, not really a deck that he prepared for, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, you, you really don't prepare for Crammer like that. It, it's not a deck most people were taking seriously and that, that's what I really love about it. You know, you see it have this 
really big finish in a 2,000 person tournament. Then you see the, the world champion or former world champion taking it to a top 16 finish, at least in this tournament, you know, still very much alive in the tournament. And I think it's a deck, it's, it's one of those that a lot of players don't take it seriously. Then a couple of results come around and all of a sudden, I think we're gonna see more of this deck moving forward. It's just now to see, you know, what is the optimal build and, and how far can this deck go, both in this tournament and in future tournaments. Yeah, it's, it's surprisingly actually a really cute metagame decision as well. Uh, we saw how far Picarom dropped from the sort of list of, you know, how much it was initially played. People were afraid to play Pikachu and Zekrom in this tournament because of the new addition of Rusted Sword. And that allows Cramorant VMAX to, you know, not worry about its uh, weakness so much. It allows it to sit into play and just deal huge chunks of damage with a really unconventional engine. We saw the highs and the lows of Skylar really there. You see it, how helpful it is at getting the Porygon Z initially into play. But then when it comes to those later stages when energy are the only cards you want to see, that Skylar didn't quite give him enough fuel to get over the line. No, unfortunately not. So congratulations to Frederico, commiserations to Robin. But like we say, there is a loser's bracket. Robin is still very much in the tournament. Now, we do have another game coming up for you. And Joe, I hope you like watching Arcus Delga and Palkia with Zash and V, because we've got ourselves a mirror match. Absolutely, we do. It's an archetype that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. And uh, yeah, one of the most popular decks in the tournament, one of the most popular decks for a long time. We are going to be having Luka Klebedeczka. He has previously got a top 32 at the World Championships. Uh, in 2017, at the Anaheim Open, he got a top eight. Also in 2017, he won the SPE in Madrid. And he is also a Switzerland national champion back in 2016. He's basically been around the block for many years now and has always been a, a really high standard of play. Absolutely. Ricardo Maganza, we don't see the recent accomplishments like that, but we saw that 2013 was a pretty good year. We had good finishes in Lyon, in Montpellier, in our course. So Ricardo, very much a player that's been around for a while and has seen some success in the past. So let's head on over to the game and see which of these ADP decks is going to come around and be successful. I think we're, we're going to see lots of parallel plays going on here, Joe. Yeah, these guys actually have, I think, around three cards different between them, and neither of them are playing Crushing Hammer, so essentially they're both just trying to get their plan A off as much as possible. I think the player going first, they just need to go, I'm going to be the pace setter, I'm going to have an energy drop each turn, I'm going to try and get that GX attack, I'm going to put the ball in my opponent's court to try and sort of mirror that setup without putting down easy basics that can get KO'd. Looks like we're starting with Ricardo on the top. He started with the optimal lead for him, that Arceus Dialgopalkia. He can also go ahead and establish that Viridian Forest. So he's already checked two big things off his list. He's got that turn one energy drop onto his main Pokemon. And Lucas started with a Dedene GX, which you never want to put down in this matchup if you can help it. No, it's just an easy free prize Pokemon time we see the Altered Creation GX come in. And if you're going to have to play it, at least get yourself a new hand of six cards. Having it being a liability on the field without having actually done anything to help you, it's, we, we love to Dene GX, but this is not why we love it. Yeah, Ricardo also chose to discard a Crobat V from his hand. That's a great indication that at the very least he has a supporter, but also a little micro play is that you're playing around Morwile GX. You don't want Morwile to pull these sorts of Pokemon into play because then it allows Luca to have easier prizes later on. So we just see the attachment of the water energy. Obviously, neither of these, playing, uh, these players are using crushing hammers. Uh, both players know the opponent's deck list. So he can freely throw the water energy down, play around Marnie as best as possible, and also end on an Intrepid Sword. Ideal turn for him. Luca already has a couple of tough decisions. Does have Quick Ball. Can go ahead and establish the Arceus Dialga Palkia pretty quickly. And then he may be forced to play a Professor's Research here to dig deeper into the deck. Might have to be. Like you say, you've got some of the paths. That Viridian Forest is going to go and get yourself one of the energy you need, which is lovely. And, you know, you've got that quick ball, which is going to get yourself presumably the ADP or maybe a Zash. And it really depends which one you which one you want more early on. And a Zash will give you the Intrepid Sword at the end of your turn if you're not attacking, which, given Luca's hand, is quite unlikely. So, yeah, we do see the Zash coming out there. Or we would imagine, still a little bit of thinking. But I think you're right, it's going to have to be a professor's research, which means you've lost two switch. You've lost one of your boss's orders, bearing in mind how much this deck loves going after those bench Pokemon. So, 
Not ideal, but at least Luca's got something going on here. Yeah, I think Luca really was hoping that, thanks to the Viridian Forest being in play, he was hoping he could have an easy discard of a Metal Energy, grab another Metal Energy, try and get some Sorcerer for aggressive Zation plays here. The Professor's Research doesn't help him do that at all, really. So he was going for Aggro uh, Zashin as, as the initial plan here. As the hand stands, he may still be forced to go for the ADP instead. And that is what we are going to eventually see here. So I like that he went for the Zashin first. It gave him the aggressive option as an alternate route here. Because let's face it, his board state is behind. He's an energy drop behind. And there's an awkward dead energy X on the field. So I don't mind him taking an alternate approach here. But uh, so far, he is still debating things. He could still go for quick fall aggressive plays. But instead, the ADP is finally going to come down. He can begin using Viridian Forest here as well to thin. I don't think he needs uh, Energy Switch so much. Probably his weakest card in his hand when he doesn't have to play around um, Crushing Hammer. He's actually going to go ahead and keep that and get rid of the Marnie. I actually really like keeping Marnie in this hand, to be honest, because he knows that Ricardo is guaranteed to GX next turn. The Stadium's sticking in play. He can go ahead and GX. And then you really want to disrupt the hand size that, the, that Ricardo sat on because you do not want them to use Boss's Orders on your Dedene. Then they just fly ahead with... Luca's got a chance so. here, Joe. Yeah. Luca's got a chance of the turn one GX attack. All yeah, he needs is a Metal Saucer. Metal Saucer would do it here. He's got the energy in the discard. He's got the water energy. He's got the energy switch. He's got the Pokemon in the active that can get out of the active. This Crobat to four, if he pulls a Metal Saucer, he's got the turn one GX attack. He does push for it. He and does he does! Metal Saucer. Okay, so, so he, he does it on his head a little bit. That's huge! Turn 1 GX attack, so no longer a turn behind, no longer an energy attachment behind. I was looking at that play, and while you were talking, I was running it through in my head, and I'm like, I'm not miscalculating here, am I? <laughs> I am not. Luke has got the turn 1 GX attack. That is huge! So it's one of those gambles where you say, okay, either I can try and money my opponent out of boss's orders, or I can try to just go far ahead. And it's a good hedge here, to be honest, when you're already holding on to that energy switch he only needed one combination piece which you know has paid off really well for him now he's on the front foot he's going to get that first attack in and he's also trying to deny ricardo from actually using any of his own the denes or crobats this turn in fear of getting boss's orders back that is great i mean ricardo was sitting there like you, you see the game's playing ricardo's on right i'm going first i've got the first attachment i am fairly sure i'm going to get the first gx attack and most of the time you're right but Ricardo being in that position and not getting the first GX attack, that really puts Luca on a great, great stead here. I mean, Luca's really hoping Ricardo plays a Dedene because then that great catcher <laughs> will just grab it straight away. It's unlikely. And like you say, Ricardo's got to be really careful here because a single energy on that ADP and Viridian Forest is in play means that we would see a KO on a Crobat, on a Morile, or on a Dedene, on those kind of Pokemon. So Ricardo's got to try and do it without playing those Pokemon. And bearing in mind, Luca's already played two of them, which isn't great for him. Yeah, bench management is the name of the game for Ricardo now. He can't catch up in terms of attacks, but if he can use boss's orders, he takes the initial three prize KO. So, you know, there's no way that Luca can establish a KO here outside of him using uh, his own Morwell GX at this point. Ricardo does have a large hand size. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Uh, but it looks like Luca is just going to be forced to win the game in three turns by two hit KOing the active, and then having a one hit KO with his Zacian onto Ricardo's. That's his prize map. Uh, whereas Ricardo is hoping to use boss's orders next turn. Absolutely. We do see thinking about the great catcher there. Could bring up the zero energy ADP and kind of force Ricardo to have some kind of switching card. We know that ADP does play a bunch of switching cards, but it does look like that's the way it's going to go here and really just make Ricardo have one more thing. Essentially, like you say, win the game in three turns rather than two. Well, let's slow it down a bit. Yeah, make him have boss's orders as well as just the raw switch in hand. Uh, is definitely better for him. We are going to see the Professor's Research here. He has that manual attachment that can now be a water energy if, if he'd like to. He's already got enough liabilities in play that playing this more well, I do really like. The hand size is large, and if they don't have boss's orders plus switch in hand, they actually don't either. They have air balloon, but Arceus Diagopalkia has a three retreat cost. So this combination of more well GX with that captivating wink <laughs> is monstrous. That was a pretty good wink. Although I do feel a bit sad for Luca that he played the great catcher 
and then got the morale to put the Tatane onto the bench. <laughs> Little bit too slow. But we do see a bunch of damage coming down here, and of course, you do get to attach those free energy to one of your Pokemon. So that is absolutely huge here. Basically setting up having the energy, sorry, to your Pokemon generally does not all have to be on the same one. And I mean, Luke has got a good board position here, and Ricardo needs quite a bit to start keeping up. They need to top deck, essentially, uh, or they need to play Professor's Research and find their own great catcher. That's the only two options that they have. I'm surprised that we don't see the Viridian Forest or any attachment at all here. So he's going for a Zashian play instead. Uh, Ricardo does play two copies of Rusted Sword, so he could try and have a response KO here, uh, saying that that's higher odds than finding his one copy of great catcher. So he's looking for Saucer Saucer Energy onto his Zashian as well as a Rusted Sword. And uh, so far, a research, possibly more push potential. Ricardo does play three copies of Dedenne GX, so he's likely to also slam another one down this turn, unless he does have access to Great Catcher here. We've seen a manual attachment onto the ADP, so I think Zashin is out at this stage. Does he have the Great Catcher? No, it's just an Ultimate Ray. And what we see here is, like we talked about parallel plays earlier, Ricardo is just doing what Luca did, but a turn behind. And at some point, you've got to switch that. You cannot just match your opponent one turn back. Oh, Luca here, however, does hit his one copy of Rusted Sword. I think he plays one or two, but he hits a Rusted Sword. Oh, but he's already got the air balloon attached. Otherwise, <laughs> he could have had the KO. I think Skylar is... No, you can't Skylar here. You have to use Gust no matter what. So you're forced to use Boss's Orders, but then your only fear factor is that you need to boss two turns in a row if Ricardo can knock out uh, your Zashian. So... We are going to see an energy commitment. He's going to put it onto a Crobat so he has no liabilities in play whatsoever. You do just go for the boss's orders here. And I think you always go for the Arcus Dialga Palkia uh, because you want you don't want to pay retreat here. You want to keep your Zashin nice and healthy on the bench. You want to ultimate ray as many cards out of your deck as possible so that you don't have any dead draws at this point. You can just go ahead and swing it onto Morwile. He set himself up for game really nicely. Yeah, he's in a great position. You know, I'm a little bit sad he couldn't just attach the Rusted Sword, Skylar for a switch and <laughs> swing for that giant KO. That's what I would have loved, but it doesn't really matter. Like you say, he's in a phenomenal position here. One more attack for the game, and there is a Zashin with free energy attached. That is pretty big. Having said that, the Rusted Sword is needed to get a KO on the ADP, and there is already an air balloon on the Zashin, so we are going to need to see some gusting here. Yeah, he's holding on to boss's orders for next turn, so that's pretty chill right now. But if Ricardo can disrupt his hand uh, with... It looks like... Let's see how many money Ricardo actually plays here. I don't think he actually plays any. Wow, okay, so he has no hand disruption. So I think he's just got no outs here. If he's got no hand disruption, that's basically game, because Luke has got an attacker... And he's got boss's orders, so yeah. All Luca needs to do here is promote the Zashian, play the boss's orders onto literally any of those Pokemon on the bench, and just click to attack and win the game. So what we've basically seen is Ricardo has just been doing Luca things one turn behind. And you can't be doing that, not in a mirror match. You've got to jump ahead in the game in some way. Ricardo's not able to do that. So Luca Brave Blades goes up one game to zero, and quite frankly, that turn one GX attack seems like it had a little bit of an impact in the outcome of that game. Yeah, your win rate as Arceus Yalga Palkia when you get that turn one GX attack is absolutely insane. <laughs> and identifying that he can make that push, knowing that he basically has nowhere else to go, right? He already has a Dedenne GX just forced into play because he started with it. So he couldn't try and go for the bench management. I'll deal with your small Pokemon first and get the first three prize knockout. He had to say, you know what, if I don't get the GX attack here, I never win this game. And it's actually really interesting looking at Ricardo's deck. He has, like, only plan A cards. He has no backup plan, no reset stamp, not even any Marnies in his deck. And he even just plays um, Viridian Forest. So he is all about just getting plan A off. And it actually turned out that Luca was able to achieve that first. Absolutely. I mean, bearing in mind, these players have come very far in a very large tournament. Whatever plans they've got have very much been working <laughs> up to now. But what we saw there was a quintessential mirror match. We saw both players doing very similar things. And essentially, the turn one GX attack just allowed Luca to jump ahead. And from there, Ricardo wasn't able to essentially jump back over and take the initiative. And unfortunately, 
that is enough to get the win in the game. So let's head on over to game two. Both players still playing the same deck as each other, though with small differences, of course, and see if we're going to see a turn one GX attack this game. I'm going to be honest, I kind of like it. <laughs> and uh, Ricardo is actually still choosing to go first. So I do like this. I think just in general, you need less pieces. Luca had to really dig deep to find that combination. He's actually drawn into an incredible hand to try and do it again, you know. <laughs> he has. <laughs> uh, but Ricardo is just going to say, I can just do the stable game plan and hope that it forces Luca to make those pushes. And either that he misses from the pushes that he makes with the Denes and Crobats, or that those liabilities are around for me to boss's orders later. And we see that the players want to go first here. Ricardo has chosen to go first. And that means that if you win game one, as Luca did, even if Luca loses game two, gets the choice of whether to go first or second in game three. So this is this is kind of like a kind of like a bonus game for Luca. If you win, brilliant, you're 2-0, you go through. If you lose, you're going into game three, but you've got the advantage of being able to choose to go first. So that's a really nice place to be. And this time, Ricardo is forced into having one of those little Pokemon to start with that you frankly don't want on the field. And Luca draws into Metal Saucer, which is not ideal for him. So it looks like he may be forced to use his own Dedenne here. He could use Energy Spinner for three targets. He could just go ahead and get rid of a bunch of Metal Energies, or at least two copies, potentially. He's going to go for all three. He could just go for Quick Ball into Dede Change if he is going to look for that turn one GX attack. But his hand is just much more awkward this time. He'll already be getting rid of a couple of Metal Saucers and he'll already be getting rid of uh, one of his energy switches. So he may end up instead just going for Arcus Dialga Palkia and hoping that the three cards from Intrepid Sword is going to be good enough instead. That very much is one way to go here. I mean, we do see the free energy there, searching through the deck, really trying to make sure what's in there, but does not seem to be wavering from those three. Of course, it's always nice to look at your prizes in the early game or look at your deck, try and figure out what's in the prizes so you don't do that silly thing where you're digging for that last metal saucer, which it turns out is prized. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, to Dene here, you would lose a bunch of resources that you don't really want to lose. And I was thinking about a second Zash in here because it does at least open up I mean, double Metal Saucer. Oh, there's no switch. Double Metal Saucer switch would actually have potentially given... A, oh, there's no second energy in the discard either. We're, yeah, we're missing a couple of pieces. But I think he may be saying, well, plan A is off the table. We're going aggro Zashkin. <laughs> it's actually uh, a game plan you can go for with this deck uh, fairly competently. He's even holding on to energy switch pieces anyway next turn. He has finally drawn into a supporter, which is something for him. So this isn't, you know, writing off Arceus Dialga Palkia just yet, but this just gives him the avenue for both sort of approaches. Because one thing that's really good for the Zacian, if he's able to limit his bench, you know, it's really difficult for Arceus Dialga Palkia to hit you for one shot. So you're looking to go for alter creation, and then you need to get a Zacian out of nowhere, which is really hard to achieve. So there still is a route here where you go without ADP. And we actually don't see a switch out for Ricardo. That is so not good. Just an attach and pass, no GX attack. That's a huge deal. That is, yeah, that's absolutely huge. He's got, you know, six cards in hand still, but no switch there. I mean, like we said, if you go second, you also if you go first, you expect to get that first GX attack. I mean, Luca's are way off at the moment, but energy switch, energy could get it. But it looks like Luca, like you say, is going for the aggro Zash in here, which I quite like. Could energy switch that third energy up? And it looks like he's going to. And that is going to get a KO on the Morile super quickly. And then that puts Ricardo in a potentially awkward situation because, you know, Luca's taken a KO and had another attack before Ricardo even starts dealing any damage on the board. So... Yeah, it looks like that's just a turn. And we do see not using the Marnie here because essentially thinking, you know what? Ricardo didn't do very much last turn. So, yeah, let's just leave him with it. Yeah, the boss's orders is the biggest question. I actually really like boss's orders here. I do. You're foregoing a couple of cards, but only allowing that GS attack and stopping Ultimate Ray is such good value for you. So playing this boss's orders down, it does mean that your Marnie has a lot of legwork to do next turn, where you need to find switch air balloon or need to find some more energy switch shenanigans. But this pressure is just so good. Denying ultimate ray is a huge win condition for you. 
Absolutely. It basically means that Ricardo's got whatever energy he can get this turn, and then he's essentially down three prizes. That's the energy he's got on the board. They're the attackers he's got available. And th this isn't, like you say, this is not plan A. This is not what you're <laughs> trying to do. But the really good players are able to do this. The really good players are able to look at their hand and go, I don't think my ADP is going to do ADP things this game. Um, all right, aggro's ashing it is. Looks like Ricardo is going to establish a big charm, which can really be quite useful when Luca hasn't used that GX attack uh, to gain the buff. So his Zashin is now sitting out of range of Blade Blade, which is really important. He's already got an energy attachment as well. So he'll probably just end on this GX, basically sacrificing his Arceus Dialgapalkia, but then putting himself on a two-turn clock to win as long as he can maintain attackers. Absolutely. Do we... Ah, now there is no Rusted Sword on the Zashin, so... Maybe we could see a pivot at some point, that that weird mid-game GX attack that you don't usually see. But if you're fairly sure you're not going to get one hit KO'd, that is actually a genuine option of just going, ah, you know what, let's give it a go. Now, more oil comes down <laughs> and gets more oil. <laughs> They're spider manning each other. They're just saying, get onto the bench. Come join me. And we're going to see the Marnie. Looking for switch outs here. Luca, now that he has committed a more while into play, it means he can still push for things like the Dene now because he's already got that liability. Why not have a couple more? So we are going to see that Cherish Ball. It means immediately Dede change here. Still looking for switch outs. He can get a manual attachment in if he wants to, but if he wants to keep the door open for Arcus Dialga Palkia, it means that he doesn't. But now he's just going to commit it to Morwal. Morwal can finish off this heavily damaged Arcus Dialga Palkia. And we do see the air balloon, but no energy switches, and there are actually no targets for this metal saucer. So a bit of a stumbling block for him. No, that is... It, it looks so good, but there's no switch to combo with the air balloon. There's Metal Saucer, but there's no energy in the discard. There's no energy switch. It's it's just leave a free energy Zashin in the active and Intrepid Sword. That is far from ideal. And we haven't denied the ultimate ray. So an energy attachment boss's orders from Ricardo here would just give a, just a phenomenal advantage in the game. Yeah, I think... They should actually be pushing for um, trying to get their Zashian into Lucas this turn. It would just take away so many sources. Lucas nowhere near able to ultimate rain. It could just run him out of attackers in general here. But based on Ricardo's hand, he's just going to swing the water energy into the Arcus Dialgapalkia, looking for boss's orders of his own by the looks of things. Yeah, grabbing that to Dene, like you say, there's enough liabilities on his bench that Dene is absolutely on the table now, literally and figuratively. <laughs> And, I mean, boss's orders is going to be big here. Like you say, trying to get rid of that Zashin and the energy would have been good. But I'm not sure it makes a huge difference. I think if Ricardo takes a, pri a KO here, then he's on the clock to win next turn. Mm -hmm. And Luca's not taking six prizes during his next true. turn. Yeah, true. Just for the prize map alone, this is mm -hmm. fine. And you're also able now to power up multiple attackers. So... Even if Luca does take a KO on anything, you're still just there, ready to rumble. So does draw into Boss's Orders. It's a huge turn. He's just one attack away from winning the game. Luca can Boss's Orders up uh, Zashian, but he currently can't knock out the one with the big charm. He would have to find his own copy of Rusted Sword to deny it. And even then, he's made another Zashian now almost ready to rumble. Yeah, I mean, we've got a free energy Zashian, a two energy Zashian. We've got the ADP in the active, only one KO needed. And we said about Zashian going aggro can win, and it can, but unfortunately, what we've seen here is not the ideal circumstance. Missing attacks, missing some of those pieces you need. It was a good idea from Luca, and in another game, there's a very good chance it would have worked. This game, it is not going the way he wanted. And it looks like Luca's not going to struggle to get a KO. He's got boss's orders. He's got great catcher. But the problem is, Ricardo is just going to take a KO next turn. Yeah, there's, there's nothing Luca has in his deck that can prevent that, unfortunately. So, yeah, he's going to take the three prizes and say, maybe Ricardo accidentally misclicks on Intrepid Sword <laughs> as the win condition. <laughs> unfortunately, that is the win condition. <laughs> If, um, if Ricardo is able to successfully click Brave Blade, he is going to win this second game. I like Luca not just hitting the concede button. You may as well let the opponent do every action that they have to to actually close here. 
and Ricardo is just going for Great Catcher just in case he uh, doesn't have the right numbers. But yeah, he does just announce that Brave Blade in the end. Just so the mind games from Luca saying, I'm not done yet. You've got to draw more cards, do more things if you want to win. But no, Ricardo does announce Brave Blade successfully for those last three prize cards. No, absolutely. That was it was a very different kind of game. Like we, you know, we didn't see that explosive turn one GX attack. We saw Luca go for Zashin plays, which looked for a little while like they might actually work and finish out the game, but unfortunately, the ADP that did ADP things ended up winning, and I think a lot of the time that's probably what's going to happen. Luca, he did not have the luck of the draw that game. But like I said at the beginning of that game, it, that was kind of like a free game for Luca. He's going into game three, he's got the choice to go first, and he's got to feel pretty good about his chances because it's not going to go that badly again, and he's going to be going first. Going to be a bit of confidence there. Yeah, this time he can go much more conventional. Uh, he tried the unconventional route, missed the switch out, which then allowed Ultimate Ray to then just, you know, take prizes and set up three attackers. So you're not coming back from that one. An unfortunate miss from him. But this time he can go for the tried and trusted GX and look for boss's orders. Absolutely. And like every good mirror match, we are tied at one game apiece. So let's go and have that deciding third game to see which of these players is going to move on through the winner's bracket. Remember, we are in winner's round six here, which means winning this game will put them on a win and in. If you win winner's round seven, you will get through to the global finals as one of the top four finishers in your region. Looks like a mulligan from Luca. No valid targets, so he's going to have to shuffle back into the deck, get a fresh hand, and allow Ricardo an additional draw here until he's able to find himself a valid Pokemon. He does find Arceus Dialgapalkia, but a non-mover of a hand. His turn one looks good, but then he needs to draw some cards. So two draws to get out of a pretty funky situation. That is a... Oh, that's Four. bad! <laughs> really nice. Now he has the <laughs> ideal turn. He can grab Zacian, and he can uh, attach and then get the metal source of value, an additional three. So, yeah, everything's looking rosy now. Yeah, that, that quick ball is a phenomenal card. <laughs> and now, as long as he draws something off into... Oh! Okay, well, it allows him to at least try and take a tempo <laughs> boss's orders KO next turn if nothing else goes well for him. But that's a surprising three cards uh, based on how many metal energies you already had. But you never say no to those additional energy cards. You're now ready to Brave Blade. So intimidating stuff... And Ricardo may have to play around aggressive Brave Blade again. I'm not sure if I'm happy with that if I'm Luca or not. I mean, on the one <laughs> hand, you love seeing two energy off of that Intrepid Sword. On the other hand, when you just want one card to get you rolling and start <laughs> getting a bit of tempo next turn and you draw two energy in a balloon, it's, it's very strange. Of course, like you say, balloon, retreat ADP, boss's orders. You've got a Brave Blade KO, but at that stage, your hand is two metal energy plus whatever you draw plus whatever your prizes are. So... And it, this didn't work last game. Luca's got to be thinking, I tried this last game and it didn't work. <laughs> Agro Zashian failed me. Does he want to go down that route again? Yeah, it, it's just entirely based on the draw again, if that can help him out. Again, Ricardo's never going to bail him here. There are no Marnies in his list. So Luca's stuck with his hand no matter what. Ricardo has that early game quick ball, can discard one of his more wild GX. He does play two copies, so really can aggressively attack the opponent's hand and limit their draw Pokemon outs at times. Luca currently not sat on any of those. Ricardo's going to go ahead and grab his uh, ADP. Also going to switch straight into it. And we also see a Rusted Sword. Looks like he's setting up for a supporter play here. Probably Professor's Research with all the hand cards that he's playing immediately as he looks for energy for turn. Actually gets rid of the Viridian Forest. So he's... That could have been a card that just allowed Luca to get that GX attack. So not using his own stadium to try and make life more difficult for Luca really heads up play. Oh, yeah. You don't want to just hand your opponent a GX attack. So, oh, that's a nice top deck. Gets <laughs> it to awesome. Dene. It's going to get him a new hand of six cards. But, I mean, what do you want to do here? Do you want to go for the boss's orders onto the Zashian and then play the Dene to set up for next turn? Or do you just play Dedene hoping to get a Water Energy or a Viridian Forest, get the first GX attack? And honestly, the way we've seen these games go so far, you've got to think that first GX attack is um, it's going to be what people are going for here. Yeah, so here's the problem. Luca will be the one putting down his own Dedene. So if he does put down Dedene GX, he'd also need to be putting down 
you know, a more while to then force Ricardo's Pokemon into play. Or alternatively, you leave the Rusted Sword open as an opportunity for your own Zacian, so you can deal with the ADP itself post GX attack. So with the Balloon to the active, that tells me that he keeps his option open to retreat attack if he wants to. So he's eyeing up his boss's orders. He might just be going for aggro two prize KO here. Instead, does forego it, goes for the new additional six cards, looking for energy spinner or <coughs> a water. Plays two of each, but doesn't find one. No, unfortunately not. I was thinking maybe he'd use the boss's orders to potentially drag up the Zashin, just to potentially buy time. So you could use a GX attack while forcing your opponent to have a switch to get their own GX attack. But it looks like we got a Brave wow. Blade into the ADP. It's not a KO, it's not a GX attack. And this is starting to look a lot more like game two than it did game one. And they chose not to turn attach either. Luca could have re-established that energy onto his ADP if he wanted to, chose not to. Just held it instead. I'm really surprised that we didn't see him re-establish the energy that he lost retreating here. But I do still think that Brave Blade is a reasonable play. Uh, he has the switch air balloon combo this time, or he can switch and turn attach to Dedene. So he can knock out the ADP and deny the ultimate ray. So this time it will be happening, at least. Ricardo's going to put down another ADP here and switch into it. Now it looks like he's going to be energy switching, so... Oh, no! The play that Luca wanted to make is being denied by Ricardo. He's got a fresh and healthy ADP into play. Looks like he just needs to find the water energy on his end here. Yeah, it's, like I say, parallel plays in the mirror match. It's all starting to look startlingly familiar. And, and this is so big from Ricardo, making Luca have the gusting. But even if he's got the gusting, he's not getting rid of the energy. And that's what was so good about the KO. It wasn't just taking free prizes. It was making sure that Ricardo had basically no energy on the board after using the GX attack. That is not the position we're in here. And... That is going to be awkward. Do you hit into another ADP? Do you take a KO not denying the energy? Do you try and get your own GX attack a turn later? None of these seem like optimal plays. We'll see. Ricardo does find the water energy, so there is going to be a GX attack here. Really smart to have maneuvered things onto a new Arceus Yalgapalkia. Rick, the only real way Luca can punish this... Oh, he can't even punish it really with Rusted Sword because he still hasn't GX attacked, so... Yeah, it's going to be more switch, like awkward switch plays by the looks of things. And uh, just trying to hit into this next ADP. But Ricardo's maneuvered away for him to guarantee the ultimate raise. So really smart decision from him. And Luca's still on an awkward hand. And what does he do? I mean, he could draw more cards by playing that second to Dene, but his opponent is potentially on ultimate ray next turn. You've got to think they are. And then there would be two little Pokemon that are in range of Ultimate Ray. So you really don't want to play that second to Dene because it gives your opponent such a good map of prizes to try and win. But if you don't play that second to Dene, what exactly are you doing? <laughs> we could have seen the energy switch over to ADP. He's always going to reset this Metal Saucer here. So either he tries to just retreat into Zacian. The Big Charm's not doing anything at this stage. That missed turn attachment last turn as well really is, I think, haunting Luca a little bit here because it's just far less likely for him to get a uh, Alter Creation GX. I feel like he could have just GX'd into Ricardo this turn or pushed for that play um, as best he could. The Big Charm does mean that your Dene is out of Gust range, which I do think is really important here. So a big draw for him. We will see the attachment, and he probably just holds this the Dene GX in his hand. Yeah, so he is going to Brave Blade now. It means that he's forced to Dene change next turn, but he's really just hoping that this keeps Ricardo out of range for a turn. And the good news here is that the GX attack isn't really needed at this stage, because you've got two ADPs which are very much in range. You could potentially use a Morale to get a KO if you wanted to in a turn or two's time. They're both GX Pokemon, so Great Catcher could be used in addition to Boss's Orders, which is always a great position to be in. So I think what Luca wants to do here is really just try and finish off those two ADP, ignore the GX attack for the second game in a row, mm -hmm. And you, I think you said a second ago, Joe, I, I don't really know what Ricardo KOs this turn. Now the big charm is on Dedene, I'm not sure there's a nice easy prize sitting there. Yeah, the short answer is he can't take a KO this turn. <laughs> Especially with two metal sources already in the discard pile, it would be outrageous for him to be able to establish a Zashin out of nowhere. Two energy switch, two saucer already 
in the discard, so it's a lot to ask for if Ricardo goes reaching for them. Um, so Lucas put himself two attacks away, and he basically with this big charm draw, he's tried to put Ricardo three turns away. So you know, as long as Luca can make the push next turn, if Ricardo doesn't use any other more wild plays, I think there's only one in his discard pile right now. Really, it's more wild that would be backbreaking for Luca here. That would be a very, very bad time. And, I mean, you've got to think that Ricardo's thinking that as well. Boss's orders, more Ryle, oh, or... Oh, both Wiles are gone. Okay. Oh. That's not on the table either. He's not thinking that, then. <laughs> I thought there was only one, but both have gone. <laughs> so that's not even on the table. One source of one energy drop. So it looks like he will be pushing here. Try and find switch out plus energy switch. Play two of each. There's a switch. Wow, oh. so we're pushing with Dedene here. I mean, you use the word outrageous, Joe, and I agree with you. There's so <laughs> many resources in the discard that you don't think this is actually going to work. Wait, there was another metal... Oh, there was a metal source, but no metal energy stuck in the in discard. Hand. Yeah, stuck in his hand. So it is just energy switch. This is a very, um... He still uh, has the porter. Skylar isn't out for him as well now. It's a he confident a play. Charm. Yeah, it, it's a big push. You see another Rusted Sword. These cards aren't super helpful. There is a Crobat for three cards for an extra push. You knew Crobat was coming there. You don't play those cards unless you're going to do something like Crobat or, you know, something that's going to mess with your hand. I'm actually so... kind of surprised. The Big Charm could have been on the Zashin instead because, you know, Luca's not GX attacked. He could have guarded against that a little bit more, but making the full push here with a Professor's Research, five cards remaining in his deck, is he able to piece together one of his last two energy switches? If he does, I mean, I mean it's... Luca's down two sources as well, you know. Wow! Oh, he's not! That's huge! And not even enough cards in his deck to go for an Intrepid Sword either. Just a hard pass. Uh, Luca oh. can't simply announce the attack, which he really wants to do. So they're going to have to push here with Dead A Change by the looks of things. If they oh, want getting to a KO. But getting this KO would be so good. Getting that energy off the board, bearing in mind all four Metal Saucer are gone. There's a couple of energy switch that have already hit the discard. There's five cards left in deck. If, if ever there was a turn you really wanted to start getting rid of your opponent's energy, this was it. And Luca might even get in a position where he's just like, I can take my time because actually you don't have enough energy. But it looks like we are going for a boss's orders off the Eldegoss here. I'm trying and... to look at Ricardo's outs, you know. Uh, Luca could just end up stalling something here to win yeah, the game. I, I think there's four switches in the discard pile for Ricardo. Ricardo plays 11 energy. There's a number of them already in the discard pile, so Luca may have identified the number of outs remaining. He could boss his orders up the backup Zashin here with that two retreat cost and just buy more time. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, bearing in mind, you know, Avaloon's not going to help even if there's any left because it's already got a rusted sword on there. But no. Really interesting. Okay, so they've backed out of this play. I think maybe just because of the number of energy switches keeps Ricardo live for retreat outs. So instead, just filling his board up with the Elder Goss, definitely should be thinking about the play before <laughs> making it. But uh, is going to back out of this, finds himself Spinner, still missing the switch outs by the looks of things. Yeah. Yeah, I think we must have seen a change in, in plan there, because you don't Elder Goss for a supporter and then just mm. discard it. There's no there's no real reason to do that. But it's what we see, you know, players changing plans on the fly. One minute they're thinking, you know what, I can boss this stall here and I, and I can just bring up that Zashin and potentially run him out of cards. And then you start second-guessing yourself and you go, well, what if he's got this? Well, what if he does this? And then you completely change. But it does look like we are going to have some gusting here, just with the great catcher instead. Onto that damaged ADP and then a Marnie. So, really just trying to limit Ooh, his opponent's nice. hand size. Yeah, well, that's finds good. Switch finds energy switch as well, so he can finish off the ADP with his own and take three prizes. Then he's just looking for boss's orders. So, that great catcher, really timely, actually keeps Luca's clock in check where he's just two attacks away. So, exactly, we are going to see the switch here. He can energy switch onto ADP and use Ultimate Ray. I think that has to be the best move here. Oh, yeah. And you can even replace the energy with Metal Sorcerer as soon as you mm. do that. So, yeah, no, I pull even more out the deck so there's no stall targets. This is looking great. It is, and this is the thing. We look at the Elder Goss for the boss's orders, then change the mind and just discard it, and we go, well, didn't really need the Elder Goss there. And then we see the turn play out, and you're just kind of like, well, this totally worked out. This was very <laughs> much the best play to go for.
And I guess, yeah, there are no other helpful Pokemon in his deck anyway, so the board management isn't a big deal unless prizes no. come into play. Um, but now getting a second Zacian established, having both of them being threats after this ultimate ray is going to be great for him. And I also like him holding the Metal Saucer, faint an awkward hand, uh, and give himself more options for next turn. Absolutely. Now we see those three prizes coming down. And potentially, Luca now is just, you know, one turn away, one KO away from winning. Oh, if he can actually float up for a KO, so that's why he benched it. Oh! Float up can actually finish the game for him. <laughs> that's amazing! <laughs> so that's why it's in play. Oh, that is wonderful. I completely missed that one. And I love seeing KOs with weird attacks like that. That makes me so happy. <laughs> All right, and he takes the boss's orders from prize cards. Looking pretty good for him here. Ricardo, you know, he can take a knockout onto the Arcus Dialga Palkia. He's got the damage buff and the Rusted Sword down, so he can take three prizes. Once again, though, doesn't play any hand disruption, so Lucas wrap this up. It really does look like he has. You know, this, this has been a weird game to watch. It's been kind of like, he's in a great position. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Oh, maybe he is. I don't know. What's that Elder Goss doing? And then we turn around, <laughs> and all of a sudden, it looks like Luca is just about to, to take home that 2-1 victory. And, I mean, Luca has played this game so, so well. That last turn was just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, he's 4D chess this game, seeing the float up play. <laughs> That's really cool. I was thinking he was looking at outs and then realized that there was other things in the deck that could have stopped Ricardo. But having that nice uh, backup plan, if everything else went to pot, meant that he had that play open to him, did get the boss's orders from the prize cards. So that's going to be enough for him to simply brave blade his way from the game. No GX attack needed, no ADP at all used that game outside of just air ballooning and switching in and out, <laughs> the aggroization plan finally in that game three was worth it. It's not very often we see an ADP mirror match where one player only uses Creation GX once in three games. It's even rarer that that player is the one who ends up victorious. <laughs> but it's just down to what we talked about earlier and about being adaptive. Looking at your hand, looking at the board, looking at your opponent and going, right, what is it that is going to win me this game? We did not see Luca do the optimal strategy there. That is not the way that game is supposed to go. But... It worked out wonderfully. Two attacks into ADP, neither of which getting a KO. That is not generally how you want to...